They met at a mutual friend's birthday party. Gabby, a giggly and cheerful girl, immediately took a liking to the charming and statuesque Mike. When he picked up the guitar and sang a heartfelt song, Gabby couldn't help but feel goosebumps. She had no chance but to fall in love with him. Mike also noticed a spectacular blonde in a purple dress and invited her to go out the next evening. They met at the mall and went to the evening movie session, followed by dinner at a restaurant. They spent the night walking through the city streets, talking tirelessly. I don't remember my parents. Gabby shared her story. I've lived with my grandparents all my life. After school, I was looking for an opportunity to help them financially. I enrolled as a part-time student at the local college of management, studying service and tourism. I also worked as a waitress and later as a hotel maid at that time. After graduation, I started working in a travel company as a customer service specialist. And what does a specialist like you do? Mike asked with playful curiosity in his voice. My task is to offer the most suitable tours for my clients and ensure that travelers have the best impressions. You could say that I am responsible for their joy. In turn, Mike shared his story, which was quite different from Gabby's. He came from a typical patriarchal family. We have a big family. I have an older sister and a younger brother, Mike said, putting his jacket on Gabby's shoulders to keep her warm. My paternal grandparents also live with us. My mum takes care of our family. You know, Gabby, my father always taught my brother and me that a man should be responsible for his family. He is my role model. I started working for my father when I turned 14. We have a family cheese factory. I worked there after school five days a week for a couple of hours each day. My father paid me a wage for each day. It wasn't much, of course, but, but money earned through labour is different from money received without working. You learn to save and spend it wisely. Curious, Gabby asked, What did you spend your first large sum of money on? I bought an expensive denim jacket. It was fashionable at the time, but it didn't last long. Within a week, I got into a fight after school and tore it up so badly that even my mum couldn't fix it. Gabby enjoyed listening to Mike's stories about his childhood, family, amusing quarrels with his siblings, and his business. Their first date was followed by a second, and then a third. Two years later, they decided to get married, and Gabby was over the moon with happiness. She envisioned a wonderful life filled with love, care, and tenderness. After all, that's how fairy tales about good girls and princes end, right? However, Gabby had no idea what would come after a happy ending in real family life, and soon learned this through her own bitter experience. After the romantic honeymoon phase, quarrels and complaints began to emerge. The relationship became strained, often triggered by trivial matters such as a forgotten bag of garbage or an unwashed cup in the sink. Additionally, Mike believed that the word wife equated to the status of a slave constantly reminding Gabby, You are my wife, and you are obliged. This was followed by a long list of obligations imposed on Gabby. Despite working herself, she was responsible for all the household chores. Due to her busy schedule, she couldn't always find the time to cook a hot dinner and serve it on the table. Mike, you could warm up the soup, cook yourself eggs, or, in the end, order takeout, said Gabby to her hungry, and grumpy husband. I really don't have time to cook. My mum had time for everything. More than once, Mike informed his spouse, keeping silent about the fact that his mother was only a housewife, and at home there should be home-cooked food, not cooked by someone unknown. Your mother is always at home. One day, Gabby couldn't bear it any longer, and exclaimed, She has no hobbies, no job, no interests. She only deals with household chores. So quit. Why do you need this stressful job? Mike quickly responded. Instead of serving strangers and their whims, take care of your man. However, Gabby, accustomed to work and an independent life since childhood, couldn't fathom giving it up. Mike also was angry with his wife's work, as she could be contacted by clients at any time, even on weekends. And when Gabby was offered a business trip abroad, he exploded. Don't even think about it, 
I know how these business trips go, and how the touristic mood lowers the moral boundaries of business travellers. Mike is used to a different life, Mike's mother commented on her son's behaviour. You should make concessions, you're a woman. He has a different vision of family life, and you grew up without parents, so you don't understand how it works. Gabby swallowed her hurt feelings and chose to remain silent. This is just a phase you're going through as you adjust to each other. Everything will get better when the child is born, the mother-in-law added. Once the baby arrives, there won't be time for arguments. And then the long-awaited two stripes appeared on the pregnancy test. Gabby decided to share the news with her husband in a special way. She bought a baby suit with tiny booties and a cute hat. Lovingly wrapping the outfit in a beautiful box with a bow, she presented the gift to Mike during dinner. "'What is this?' Mike asked, intrigued by the gift. "'It's a surprise,' Gabby replied, beaming with anticipation. The man untied the golden ribbon and lifted the lid. Initially, confusion and surprise appeared on his face. He took out the tiny booties, held them in his hand, and then saw the tiny baby suit. Finally, he noticed the positive pregnancy test with a bow. Gabby, he whispered, are you pregnant? Congratulations, exclaimed Gabby. You're going to be a father. A brief streak began in the lives of the future parents. For the first five months, the expectant mother felt like she was over the moon. Even with her rounded figure and large belly, she felt light, eagerly anticipating motherhood and meeting her child. During screenings and ultrasound exams, doctors noted the absence of any abnormalities in the fetus. Soon, the sex of the child was revealed. It was going to be a boy. And then, Gabby got a devastating blow. She accidentally discovered her husband's affair with his colleague. It happened in a foolish and absurd way, reminiscent of one of the ridiculous melodramas that Gabby's grandmother loved to watch while cooking meatballs and potatoes in the kitchen. That evening, the woman was cleaning the house, dusting and ironing her rounded belly simultaneously. She picked up her husband's smartphone from the nightstand, and right at this moment the screen lit up, revealing an incoming message from his colleague Heather Bell. Gabby would not have thought to open and read her husband's correspondence, as she trusted him completely, but the message was ambiguous. In it, Heather told her boss how much she missed him and how lonely and cold it was in her bed without him. There were also photos of Heather in her underwear, and sometimes without it. What a fool I am. Gabby shivered with excitement and shock. So this is where he disappeared in the evenings, coming back when I was asleep. This is where he worked hard for our bright future. Tears streamed from Gabby's eyes, as she nervously shook. In this state, Gabby was caught by her husband, who came out of the shower. Gabby, what's wrong with you? He rushed to his wife, alarmed. Are you sick? Is something wrong with the baby? Gabby looked into his concerned face, and his gaze made her even more painful. I'm just crying with happiness. I'm happy about how wonderful you are. I wish I had known before that you are such a wonderful boss, Mike. Gabby said to her husband, holding out his smartphone. Your employees even miss you at night and can't sleep without you. Gabby, I can explain everything, Mike exclaimed, immediately trying to figure out how to justify himself to his wife. Don't, Gabby said. Don't you dare lie to my face and make up another fairy tale. The woman was devastated by her husband's infidelity, and as a result she ended up in the hospital with a nervous breakdown. The cheating husband began making daily visits to the hospital. He came ashamed like a beaten dog, except he didn't whine under the windows. Let's break up, Gabby said when she finally had the chance to talk to her husband. You'll be free to do whatever you want. However, to her surprise, Mike did not want to. Forgive me, Gabby, I made a mistake. I swear every day I regret it. I don't want to lose you, my darling. It was just a fling. Nothing serious. You realise it was just an attraction. I'm a man. I need passion. And you're pregnant. 
I swear I'll never do that to you again. He promised, tearfully kissing her hands. Mike saw how difficult it was for Gabby to say no to him and erase all the years they had spent together. You have no right to condemn our child to a life without a father, Gabby. I will be the best father for him, he pleaded, seeing her doubts. And Gabby succumbed to the onslaught of apologies and vows of eternal love. The thought of raising a child alone was scary, and Mike was right that the baby didn't deserve to grow up without a father. When the recovered wife was discharged from the hospital, Mike carried her in his arms until the birth. He fulfilled her whims and desires, spoiled her with favourite desserts and healthy fruits. In these couple of months, he had become the same Mike from the distant past, in love, romantic and caring. And then the long-awaited day had arrived. Painful contractions, the orderly tone of doctors during labour, and the long-awaited cry of the child. And then the long-awaited cry of the child. And then the baby's face had a gaping hole in his upper lip that extended to his nose. The doctors looked at each other as they announced the diagnosis to the new mother, who hadn't even had time to fully rejoice at her son's birth. The boy's diagnosis is congenital cleft lip and palate, the doctors informed her. What now? What are the consequences for us? Gabby asked with a sinking heart as she cradled the baby snugly, nestled on her breast. Despite the defect on the baby's face, Gabby's love for him was deep and unconditional. In this condition, there is a defect in the tissues of the upper lip, causing displacement and deformation of the lip and nose contours. It may affect the child's speech and bite in the future, and there is a possibility of deformity in the upper jaw. Surgery will be necessary. Gabby, having recovered from the initial shock, felt a strong bond with her son. She and Mike had not yet decided on a name for him, but as she looked at him, the name David came to mind. David. Gabby whispered mentally, gently kissing her baby's head. David, my son, my little one. The fact that the child had a defect only deepened Gabby's love for him. However, not everyone shared the same attitude. Upon hearing the news from the maternity hospital, Mike's relatives began to call the exhausted Gabby. Their reactions were all the same. No one in the family wanted a child with a deformity. He will become a freak, a burden for you, and a laughing stock for others. He will be bullied for the rest of his life. Do you really want a son like that? Mike's mother repeatedly asked Gabby. We will have the surgery, Gabby insisted time and time again. This defect is not a problem anymore. Really? I have also learned a lot about these babies. There will be a long rehabilitation process and the scar will remain. He may have speech problems and who knows what else. What kind of job will he be able to get? What kind of family will he have? Who will look at him with that face? The woman persisted. Write a refusal. You're young. You can give birth to a healthy child. Don't torment yourself or Mike. My poor Sonny is totally frustrated by that. Gabby was disgusted by the absurdity of it all. She couldn't fathom that these people actually believed what they were saying. Could they actually discard a precious baby, like a defective item? A baby so small and defenseless, it was incomprehensible to her. But what struck her the most were her husband's words over the phone. Well, Gabby, he began, his slurred voice revealing his drunkenness. I was told that such a pathology can only be caused by bad heredity. These children are born to alcoholics and drug addicts. But that's a lie. We are healthy, you know that, Gabby protested, feeling a mix of anger and hurt for herself and her innocent child. We are? But who were your parents? You never told me, her husband hissed into the phone. Maybe they were alcoholics, drug addicts. What else haven't you told the truth about? Maybe you made up a story and conveniently forgot about them. Tears welled up in Gabby's eyes and she hung up the phone, not wanting to listen 
to her husband's accusations. When Gabby asked the doctor about the possible causes of the condition, he tried to reassure her as much as possible. There can be many reasons, not just genetics. For example, poor environmental conditions, viral and infectious diseases, complications during pregnancy, or imbalances in certain vitamins. Did you experience any stress during pregnancy? That could also be a factor. Gabby recalled her husband's infidelity and the difficult process of forgiving him. She remembered how her fingers trembled and her heart raced. Could it be the reason? In the end, the child who was supposed to bring Gabby and Mike together and mend their broken relationship only drove them further apart. Gabby's rose-colored glasses fell off, and the sharp shards pierced her face, causing pain, but also awakening her. She looked at her husband with new eyes, wondering how she hadn't seen all of this before. Had his callousness, indifference, and aggression been so well hidden that she hadn't noticed them? Could she have fallen in love with such a man? He must have been influenced by his relatives, Gabby thought, trying to justify him. He was always under the pressure of his parents, their opinions, with almost no freedom to have his own thoughts and make choices. I need to see him and find out everything face to face. No one came to the maternity hospital to pick up Gabby, so she had to take a cab home. As soon as she entered the house, she called out to the new father, asking if he wanted to meet his son. However, Mike's reaction to the baby was one of contempt and disgust. If you gave birth to an invalid, then bring him up yourself. I need a normal heir, not a sick child. Mike, are you out of your mind? It's just a cosmetic defect. The woman was indignant. What will he have? A scar on his face. Some children are born with incurable diseases, severe heart defects. That's a really terrible situation. But our baby will only probably not pronounce some letters well. It's not my baby, Gabby. Mike harshly cut off his wife. If you choose him over me, I'm leaving. That evening, Mike packed his things and left his wife a newborn son. He made it clear that he had no intention of returning to their apartment. Much later, she learned that Mike did not return to the family nest under the wing of his mother. No, the man began to live together with his mistress Heather. Over the phone, Mike told Gabby that if she signed the divorce papers and got the child registered in her name, she could keep the apartment. He also promised to provide some financial support initially. Gabby didn't have the strength to argue or throw her phone against the wall. The first few months of her child's life were a blur, filled with tears of resentment, injustice, hormonal changes, and worries about milk supply and sleepless nights. Everything will be all right, David, she said one dark night to her son, pressing the baby to her breast and choking on her tears. Do you know that scars adorn a man? I'll have you the strongest, the bravest, the best. I will love you more than life. I'll do anything for you. In Gabby's life, only her grandmother remained. Her grandfather had passed away long ago. Despite Gabby's protests and assurances that she could manage on her own, her grandmother came from the village to help. She sold her house to gather some money and moved in with Gabby and David. To hell with your mic, grumbled the older woman menacingly and resolutely. The trash has cleaned itself out of the house. What kind of real man would give up his wife and child? We'll find you a new one, Gabby. Don't whine. We'll bring up the child. And get a grip on yourself. The child needs you healthy and strong. Gabby dedicated all her spare time to her son. She never let him out of her sight and closely monitored his feedings to prevent him from choking. At night, she woke up multiple times, not just to change diapers, but also to check on David's breathing. Gabby tried her best to protect him from any potential danger. She read reference literature about his condition and joined a forum where parents of children with similar conditions shared advice. When David turned six months old, he had surgery to repair his lip. 
As time went on, he continued to grow, but efforts to speak only resulted in throaty sounds. This continued until he turned five years old, at which point David had surgery to close his palate. When the stitches were removed and the pain subsided, a miracle occurred for the entire family. David spoke. Gabby would remember for the rest of her life the moment when David first uttered the word every mother cherishes. Mum! Although many mothers heard this word much earlier, Gabby's joy was immeasurable. From that moment on, David became an unstoppable chatterbox. It seemed like he was trying to make up for all the years of silence, constantly chattering and wanting to know and share everything. And the boy spoke perfectly, without any nasal quality, contrary to what doctors and acquaintances had warned Gabby about. But they still encountered problems. David did not attend kindergarten at all, and he had to face with his bully peers in first grade. One day, the boy came running home in the middle of the school day, slamming the door and leaving his backpack in the hallway. Only Grandma was home, busy cooking pea soup and croutons. She found her great-grandson in a pitiful state. His hair was dishevelled, his white shirt was missing buttons, and one of his eyes was red. "'What happened, David?' the elderly woman exclaimed, dropping her kitchen towel. "'I'm not going to school any more!' The child sniffed angrily. They all call me names. They say that my face is crooked and my lip is strange. Over time, David learned to accept the situation and the attention from others. As he grew older, he became more confident and charming. To all questions about his scar, he would respond enigmatically with a smile or answer with made-up stories, depending on his mood. A dog attacked my face. A huge pit bull terrier, he would say. An arrow flew into my face, but I caught it with my teeth, he would laughingly explain. I got kissed by a fan, he would tell a new tale, slyly looking at the pretty girl. David managed to turn his aesthetic flaw into a unique feature. Scars adorn a man, his mother would repeatedly say, encouraging him. She had been telling him this since childhood, and David believed it. In many ways, Gabby played a significant role in ensuring that David grew up as a confident and secure individual. She surrounded him with love and care, never allowing him to doubt that he was a wonderful person. When David was still a baby, Gabby had discussions with a representative from a charitable foundation that assisted children with congenital defects. I worry about his future, Gabby admitted honestly. Children can be mean and cruel. What if his peers bully him? You know, the most important thing for a child is the atmosphere within the family. The attitude of the people around them depends on it, a specialist told Gabby. It's similar to when you plant two seeds in the soil. You speak affectionate words to one and mean, insulting words to the other. Only the one you treat kindly will germinate. It's the same with children. Our ward had a family where his parents were ashamed of him. They wouldn't even leave the house. As a result, he grew up to be uptight, nervous, and unsociable. He believed that he wasn't worthy of socialization and kindness from others. He was burdened with insecurities. On the other hand, when a child feels loved, they grow up to be happy. If a person is confident and feels healthy, the rest of the world has no chance to disagree with them. Gabby also worried that her son was growing up without a male role model, surrounded only by women. That's why, at the age of eight, she enrolled her son in karate. Gabby, are you crazy? Grandma exclaimed, while flipping pancakes on the griddle. You should have sent him to hockey instead. At least they wear helmets. That's where he would have broken his nose, for sure. And by the way, your hockey players don't have any teeth left because they lose them on the ice or get them knocked out with their sticks, Gabby argued. Karate is a Japanese martial art that fosters willpower, character, and even communication skills. Despite the arguments between David's great-grandmother and mother, the karate lessons turned out to be useful. His health improved, 
and he became more confident. In high school, Gabby started discussing the topic of plastic surgery. David, I've been saving up for plastic surgery, she said, calling her son for a serious conversation. Mum, the guy waved her off with a laugh. What am I to you? Some kind of girl to get lip surgery? Maybe I should get some Botox too. At first, Gabby looked at her son, trying to see if there was any internal discomfort behind his laughter. Although she didn't see any flaws in his appearance and considered him incredibly handsome, she knew that her mother's heart can be a biased critic. She simply wished for her son to live in harmony with himself and be happy. As time passed, the scar on his lip seemed to fade as he grew older. It became paler and narrower. Whenever David smiled, which happened very frequently, his smile looked extremely attractive and artistic. He never felt insecure and always had the attention of girls, which is important for a high school student. Overall, Gabby succeeded in the most important thing. She raised a confident young man. Charismatic and charming, he spoke beautifully and had a beautiful singing voice. Grandma often commented, An artist is growing up, a future Sinatra. But fate turned out differently and took David far away from the way of singers and actors. David chose the path of a lawyer for himself. After school, he applied to the local state university at the Faculty of Law. The days felt long, and the whole family anxiously waited for the results. Gabby was particularly exhausted. At the designated day, when David was supposed to find out the result, she nervously paced around the office, peering at her colleagues' faces. Don't worry so much, Gabby. Courtney, Gabby's friend and colleague, pulled her back. Your naughty boy will get in. He's clever. With his sharp tongue, he'll build a successful career as a lawyer. That's true, the woman nodded, pouring a glass of water from the cooler. But law is a highly competitive field, especially for budgetary positions. Would I be able to pay for his education? At that moment, Gabby's cell phone rang. Well, David, what is it? Mum, the voice of her son sounded distant. How much money do we have saved? Gabby's legs weakened and she sat down on the computer chair like a doll. She immediately realised her son got accepted, but only for paid tuition. Gabby had money. She had been saving for David's plastic surgery for a long time, not wanting to spend it in case David changed his mind and wanted to remove the scar. Well, Gabby said, looking at herself. Don't worry, David, we'll figure something out. We'll have enough money for the first year, maybe even two. Gabby remembered that studying law was expensive, but she couldn't recall the exact amount. Her son suddenly laughed. Do you want to say that we have a large sum of money somewhere, and you're still wearing an old jacket? David's voice sounded cheerful and businesslike, devoid of the previous mournful tone. No, Mum, that's not good. I hope you take a significant amount from there and buy yourself some new clothes. As the mother of a budget student, you have to look your best. Gabby blinked, trying to process the information she had just heard. Courtney nervously watched her face, crunching on a waffle and nodding inquisitively. So, what's the news? What's happening? And Gabby couldn't answer what was happening because she didn't even understand it herself. Mum, have you lost the power of speech? Or have you fainted from happiness? I'm telling you that I got in, on a budget. A few years of studying, and your son will become a lawyer. Why are you silent? David, darling, congratulations. Once she had regained control of her emotions, Gabby babbled. Let's celebrate tonight, shall we? I'll buy a cake. I'll cook your favourite meal. Would you like that? But Joy settled in their apartment for only a brief period. One morning, Grandma didn't get up, didn't put on her favourite yellow slippers, and didn't shuffle her way to the kitchen for tea. Both David and Gabby were mourning the loss of a loved one. Grandma had filled the role of Gabby's mother during her childhood, and had become a reliable support when Gabby became a mother herself. A gaping and cold void replaced Gabby's heart, leaving her with only one source of joy in her life, her son. 
You should find a man, Gabby, Courtney unexpectedly said four months later. They were spending Friday evening together, and when the women switched from tea to stronger drinks, Courtney had awakened her inner matchmaker, eager to find a boyfriend for her friend. Man? Gabby frowned. Yeah, her friend exclaimed. You spend every evening alone at home. Besides work and the apartment, you see nothing. Soon you'll be covered in dust and mould. It can't go on like this. Where's your laptop? Rolling up her sleeves and armed with a glass of white sparkling wine, Courtney opened the first dating site that came up. Do you have any beautiful photos? She asked businesslike as she pressed the registration button. When David, a third-year student, returned home, he found the two women doubled over in laughter. They were sitting in front of a laptop screen, looking at and reading particularly interesting profiles. The idea, which initially seemed like a prank and a delusion to Gabby, turned out to be not so bad. She began communicating with men and going on dates. Gabby received compliments once again, feeling feminine and attractive. One evening after dinner, David said to his mother, Listen, Mum, I'd like you to meet someone. With whom? Gabby had never broached the subject of girls and relationships with her son. Secretly, she worried about his romantic endeavours. My girlfriend, Nancy, David announced his news warmly. She works part-time as a photographer and studies journalism at my university. We met when I was in my second year, and she was in her first. A year later, we started dating. David looked at his mum with a smile. Listen, mum, things seem to be getting serious. Nancy is a beautiful girl, and you'll definitely like her. The meeting took place over the weekend. The initial awkwardness quickly dissipated. The charming brunette with brown eyes, an open smile, and a contagious laugh conquered Gabby, and the way Nancy looked at David dispelled any doubts. Observing her son's happiness, Gabby decided to take one more step toward her own destiny. That same evening, when the young couple went out for a walk, leaving her alone with chocolate cake, Gabby opened her laptop once again. She had never made the first move before, even though she liked men's profiles. But inspired by her son's happiness, Gabby took a deep breath, as if diving into cold water, and began typing a message to a man named Harrison. According to his profile, Harrison was involved in soccer, enjoyed cooking and travelling, and was a fan of jazz music. The profile didn't mention his occupation, but Gabby was drawn to his kind face and diverse interests. They started communicating, went on their first date, and then more followed. Gabby herself didn't realise how their initial attraction grew into love, but what mattered most was that their feelings were mutual. Harrison adored Gabby, and quickly formed a bond with David, becoming like a member of their family. When David graduated from university, it wasn't just his mother who came to congratulate him. Standing proudly next to her was Harrison. Nancy, wearing a beautiful dress, eagerly snapped photos, wanting to capture every moment. The four of them went to the restaurant, resembling the big family that Gabby had always dreamed of. David! Congratulations on graduating from university. Harrison raised his glass to make a toast. A new chapter of your life has begun. I sincerely wish you success in pursuing your favourite career, which will bring you a good income. May your future be rich, bright and beautiful. And remember, if you ever need help, know that you can always rely on me. There will always be a job for you. Harrison founded the company specialising in designing and selling water treatment plants, along with related services, and he immediately offered David a position as a lawyer, but David politely declined, as he had chosen to pursue a career in law. That evening, Gabby looked at her son and his girlfriend with joy. David confided that he wanted to propose to Nancy, and she was ready to support him. Ten years passed. A grown-up David parked a black foreign car in the office building's parking lot. He stepped out of the car, adjusting his elegant suit. He always believed that one is judged by their appearance. Carrying his briefcase, filled with new case files, he headed to the office. This week, he was asked to help the businessman 
who had previously fallen victim to an unscrupulous lawyer, who not only failed to solve the client's problem, but also left him penniless after taking a large sum of money. David was familiar with such companies. Their main objective was to secure a contract, after which they transformed from competent professionals into deceptive tricksters. David had his own small law firm, but he hired only the best lawyers who were passionate about their work and upheld the integrity of the profession. Additionally, he is actively involved in charity work and has founded the platform Kindness of Themis. Through this platform, he provides free or low-cost legal assistance. It was through this foundation that a man named Mike Campos approached David. His case was intriguing. There were clear indications that he had been framed and falsely accused of an economic crime. Despite the efforts of his previous lawyer, nothing had been accomplished. The court had sentenced Mike to six years in prison for fraud. David took on this case, not only because it interested him, but also because Harrison, who personally knew the victim, asked him to do so. During their meeting, Mike shared his story with David. I used to have a family cheese factory, he told the lawyer, but when my father retired and left the business to me and my brother, we decided to expand, and we succeeded. The family business transformed into a large agricultural holding. However, we needed additional funds and partners. We found what seemed to be the right people, but things took a turn for the worse. We discovered fraudulent activities involving money, I was wrongfully accused of embezzling millions of dollars that I had never even seen. It became clear to me, later, that our so-called partners were not who they claimed to be. They set me up and wanted me out. It's too late to lament now. Will you help me? Mike asked hopefully, his eyes filled with desperation. I'll do my best, David replied, nodding with determination. I will fight to clear your name. David was confident in his abilities. He never gave false hope to his clients. He had already identified numerous flaws in the case, such as the previous lawyer's failure to pursue an independent examination. The examination conducted by the prosecutors was far from satisfactory. Additionally, his colleague had not verified the authenticity of the documents that the court deemed to be falsified, disregarding the need for an explanation. David felt a surge of excitement, like a sniffer dog on the trail of its prey. He knew he would never give up. Harrison Weir had spoken highly of you. He believes that if anyone can win this case, it's you, Mike said, clearly viewing David as his last hope. David smiled when his stepfather was mentioned, but he decided not to disclose their connection. It was unnecessary. Harrison never interfered his family into his work. I will find a way to express my gratitude later, the businessman promised. Right now, everything has been taken away from me, my money, my business, and even my property. Sometimes I provide assistance pro bono, so don't worry about that, David reassured him. Believe me, I will do everything within my power to help you. David was aware that strange, even mystical legends had started to circulate about him. Satisfied clients, out of gratitude, spread stories about his incredible abilities as a defence lawyer and his legal savvy through word of mouth. But all David did was faithfully and diligently perform his job. Now he was staying up all night studying the details of the case. His hair stood on end as he discovered new inconsistencies and gross violations. There were too many critical and unacceptable mistakes in Mike Campos's case. I saw the light under the door, and there you are. You're not sleeping, scolded Nancy as she entered his study. You already look like a monster from horror movies, pale, dishevelled, bruises under your eyes. David switched his gaze away from the papers and turned to his wife. I've looked like a monster since I was a kid. Don't be silly, Nancy approached and gently kissed the scar above his lip. Then she began to knead his stiff shoulders with dexterous fingers. David purred with pleasure, like a well-fed cat. Well, how's it going? Nancy nodded towards the scattered documents on the table. I'm going to win it, declared David, confident in his abilities. And then, 
take a vacation. Otherwise, I'll soon forget what you look like, and our daughter will start calling you uncle, Nancy said sternly. I give you my word, as soon as I wrap up this case, you and I will take the little ones and go wherever you wish, the man promised his wife. Why aren't you asleep? Erica woke me up, the woman smiled, and her tone immediately warmed at the mention of the child. She was hungry. I fed her and went to get a drink of water. Erica was the youngest daughter of Nancy and David. Their baby just turned nine months old last week. Erica was not the only child. Their eldest son, Charles, was already seven. He was currently visiting his grandparents in the countryside. There, Harrison and Gabby, who had been married for a long time, had built a cosy two-story house. They often took their grandson to stay with them for various reasons. Sometimes it was because the strawberries were ripe and the child needed vitamins from the garden. Other times it was because the apples were ready to be picked. And sometimes Grandpa Harrison simply insisted that the child needed fresh air instead of the city's pollution. Charles enjoyed these trips. He already had friends outside the city, children and grandchildren of neighbours. And Grandpa Harrison would take the boy fishing and into the forest to hunt for mushrooms. David never shared his secret fear with anyone. What if his children were born like him? He didn't consider himself ugly, but he didn't want his children to face the same fate. He was particularly worried about Erica. Fortunately, everything turned out well. Their children were healthy, happy, and their loving parents considered them the most beautiful. Go to bed, Nancy, the man said, catching his wife's hand and kissing it. He knew she was exhausted from taking care of the children. David felt guilty for not helping Nancy more. She managed all the responsibilities of the children and the household without complaining. Even when he was at home, he spent increasingly more time in his study. You should do the same, his wife said, kissing the workaholic on the head, obediently heading to the bedroom. David watched his wife until the door closed behind her. Then he tiredly rubbed his eyelids, as if trying to regain energy. The day of the trial had arrived. Mike Campos looked pale and agitated. David thought his client had more grey hair than at their last meeting. He appeared genuinely unwell. Don't worry, everything is under control, David assured him, attempting to calm him down. Thank you, David, the man sincerely said. The lawyer grinned. You'll thank me when you're free. The hearing seemed to fly by for the lawyer, but for everyone else, five hours passed slowly. After hearing the defendant's final statement, the court retired to the deliberation room to reach a verdict. The participants in the trial anxiously waited in ignorance for another half an hour. Mike Campos was exhausted. He couldn't calm his hands, which drummed his fingers on the table, or stop his foot from jittering under the table. He continuously wiped the sweat from his forehead with a handkerchief. David remained as calm as a statue, repeatedly pouring water for the man. Why are they absent so long? Mike asked, finishing his second glass of water. It's only been fifteen minutes, the lawyer commented. And then the heavy door to the courtroom opened. The judge in the black robe returned to his seat. His impenetrable face revealed no emotions. Everyone stood up, and the hall froze in anticipation of the verdict from the pinnacle of justice. David, who had been composed, felt his heart race and pound in his throat. He felt like a runner approaching the finish line. Would he be the first to cross it and claim victory? Or would someone more cunning and faster overtake him? The moment of truth had arrived. The defendant, Mike Campos, is found not guilty of the crime, the judge monotonously pronounced. David, standing at attention, noticed from the corner of his eye that his client leaned back in his chair. Thank God it was not a fainting spell, but a manifestation of overwhelming happiness. It was so powerful that Mike couldn't even stand on his feet. After the hearing, he shook David's hand for a long time, gripping it tightly and unable to let go. 
Thank you, dear, mumbled Mike. I won't forget it for ages. David smiled good-naturedly, patting the man on the back. The lawyer said goodbye to the satisfied client, hurrying back to his family. He was overwhelmed by his favourite sense of triumph, which he hurried to share with his loved ones. After all, if one celebrates victory, it is with family and loved ones. What happened would have remained only in David's memory and records, if not for the ending, worthy of a Shakespearean play. It happened a month later. David was in his office when his mother dropped by. Both had a fresh tan on their skin. David himself looked rested and fresh. The lawyer was enthusiastic and eager to take on new court cases. As he promised his wife after closing the case, they went on a two-week trip to Crete, and by family, he meant all the grandparents as well. The poor Labrador dog, Cooper, who belonged to David's mother, was the only one left behind. The vacation was great. Delicious food, olive trees, interesting excursions to the Cave of Zeus, and a water trip to the Cove of the Three Seas. It was difficult to return to the reality of everyday life, as if being pulled out of a fairy tale and shoved back into the routine. But as soon as David was in the office and immersed in the familiar atmosphere, a sense of stupor left him. He was in his element, jurisprudence, like a fish in water. Ten minutes after Gabby entered her son's office, Mike Campos also came to the company office. The pretty secretary informed him that there was a visitor in David's office, so he would have to wait in the waiting room. Mike was in no hurry. Thankfully, he came here not with a problem but out of kindness. His business was still in a bad way, and he was deeply involved in trying to get it back on track quickly, but he was incredibly impressed with the lawyer's work, so when he learned that the man was back in town, he hastened to pay a courtesy visit. He hoped to invite the man to dinner, finally thanking him for his titanic labour. Mike Campos felt sympathy for the man at the first meeting on an intuitive level. "'Maybe coffee or tea?' asked a blonde, in a classic suit politely, peering out from behind the counter. "'Thank you, I'll pass,' the man smiled back, noting how well everything was organised in this company. The lawyers passing by were neatly and presentably dressed, all polite, collected, but pleasant. Not a single frowning face. It was as if David had assembled a team not only of competent people, but also of kind and sincere ones. The man did not notice how the door to the lawyer's office opened ajar. A visitor came out of it. She approached the secretary exchanged a few words and was about to leave. But upon noticing Mike, the woman stood up like a stumbling block. Mike, she whispered hesitantly. The man raised his head and frowned. In front of him was a beautiful, statuesque woman in a beige-coloured business suit. The blonde appeared mature, but well-groomed and gorgeous. Mike, it's you, isn't it? She repeated as the man remained silent and then a sharp arrow of recognition pierced him to the heart. Gabby! Not believing his eyes, he exclaimed. The man jumped up from his seat, taking a step toward the woman. He looked stunned and enchanted by her, as if a beautiful vision had appeared before him, not his former spouse. Gabby smiled, having recovered from the shock. Despite all the misfortunes that had befallen her many years ago, she was still the same kind and forgiving person. Once, long ago, she thought that she would never forgive Mike for such a deep offence. But now the woman realised that she no longer felt hatred or anger, just a faint taste of bitterness. You, you look beautiful, Mike said, and Gabby nodded gratefully, accepting the compliment. What are you doing here? Are you here to see a lawyer? Do you need some help? Is something wrong? The woman did not have an opportunity to answer, because the door next to them opened and a man came out. David, hello, Mike started at once, remembering why he came to the lawyer's office. I came to thank you, if not for you. No need. For me, the highest degree of gratitude is the triumph of justice. The young man smiled modestly, shaking the outstretched hand. Then he turned to the woman, who looked confused. 
Mum, is everything all right? Do you know each other? David asked his mother. These words, said softly and calmly, sounded like thunder in a clear sky for Mike. He looked again into the face of the lawyer, so zealously defending his interests in the courthouse. He saw something that he had noticed before, but had not paid much attention to. A scar that stretched as a white stripe from his nose to his lip, barely visible on his light skin, it now stood out clearly, brightly as if mocking the man. Gabby, the man whispered, turning white as a sheet. Gabby, it can't be. Lately, life had constantly tripped Mike and hit him in the back, as if punishing him for past sins and mistakes. And now, there was another blow. Gabby, he could only squeeze out, looking at the young adult who turned out to be his own son, whom he had once abandoned. David sat the man, who was on the verge of fainting, on the sofa, and poured cool water from the cooler. Mum, what's going on? asked David when Mike began to come to himself, and the colour returned to his face. David, the woman, bit her lip in indecision. Was it worth it to reopen an old wound now, after so many years? But Mike, meeting her gaze, nodded weakly. In his eyes, around which gathered a fine mesh of wrinkles, pain, longing, and regret could be read. The woman felt that the man had changed. However, it was too late. Gabby sighed, daring to tell the truth. I never told you about your father. That's my mistake, I guess. Anyway, meet him. Mike Campos is your biological father. However, this information didn't cause any violent emotions in David's soul. He realised that he had not been born from a test tube in the laboratory, although such thoughts occasionally arose in his head when he was five or seven years old. But no, this is his father. But what is he exactly? A donor of part of the cells that allowed him to be born. But so what? For him, the same Harrison, who appeared in David's life at the age of twenty, was more father than Mike, or the coach who taught the boy karate. I realise that asking for forgiveness now is an empty sound, Mike began his confession, and I don't ask you to understand me. I thought at the time that I was doing everything right. When I came to my senses it was too late, and people around me said different things, even that the baby wasn't mine, especially my mother and grandmother, and I, the fool, was fooled. That's what Gabby thought, too. According to her ex-mother-in-law's opinion, her dear boy could not become the father of an unhealthy baby. Mistress Heather got involved, too. The cunning snake approached the inconsolable father in time, wrapped around him in tight rings, hissed in his ear, did not let go. But all this did not justify Mike, neither in Gabby's eyes nor in David's eyes. He became a stranger to them. Only if Gabby let go of resentment then her son still had a choice. She would accept any decision he made. Now I realise how monstrous a mistake I made. I have no happiness in my life, no family, no loved ones, besides my brother and sister. They already have families, and I have an empty apartment. Business. And that would have lost everything to the last penny if not for David, the man lamented. I did not save you, my wife and son, lost himself, happiness and the meaning of life. I have long forgotten everything, Mike, the woman answered him in a calm tone, forgotten like a terrible dream. Gabby spoke with all sincerity. She had long been happy. She had a beloved husband, who loved her madly, the best son, from the pride for which she sometimes glowed. She had a lovely daughter and lovely grandchildren. Happy people don't hold grudges and don't wish them on anyone. Gabby realised that it's much better to forgive and forget than to let negative feelings drive happiness out of your life. A lingering resentment destroys you from the inside out, sharpening your heart like a worm eats an apple. And then, as if all this hadn't happened, where would she be now? Her husband's mother and other relatives would have created from her life a patriarchal family in their own village, killing the woman in Gabby. She wouldn't have met Harrison then, and David would have grown up entirely different if he hadn't been taken away altogether. No, Gabby would never have traded her life for another. I'm grateful to you anyway, Mike, 
She grinned softly. You gave me the main gift, a son, the most beautiful gift in the world. Mike raised a stricken look at the lawyer. Will you forgive me, David? It was clear that from his tongue wanted to burst another word, instead of the young man's name. But Mike did not dare to say the word aloud. It was too personal and important. He didn't deserve it. David was silent, thoughtfully resting his chin on his crossed fingers. He sat in his chair, listening attentively to the story of his mother and the man he couldn't even mentally call his father. It was as if the subject were acting as a judge, sitting on a podium in front of both sides, the accused and the accuser. I hold no grudge against you, he began carefully considering his words. I have no reason to bear a grudge against strangers, but I want you to understand me correctly. He raised his eyes as blue as Gabby's and Harrison's, looking intently and openly into the face of his biological father. I don't have a father. I only have a mother who bent over backwards to raise me. She fed me from a spoon or a dropper when there was a hole in my face. She didn't sleep at night. She cried into her pillow when she thought I didn't notice it. Gabby sighed sadly, turning away and hiding the tears that had come. The words spoken by her son brought her back to such a terrible past for a small moment. When I had my second operation, I was five years old. The young man continued, looking at the slumped, as if aged Mike with a clear gaze. Usually people do not remember very well what happened in their childhood years. Only I clearly remembered this piece of life. David frowned as he reconstructed this part of his story. When they took out the stitches, I was wildly in pain. But Mum was in a lot more pain than I was. That's when I realised I had no right to complain and cry. My mum was always dragging me to doctors. Neurologist, speech therapist, psychologist, orthodontist. And to go to see them, she could work around the clock. When I was bullied at school, she was there for me. She took me by the hand to karate. She made time to attend all the school events. She brought tea to the room in the middle of the night when I was preparing for my diploma defence. She helped my wife pick out her wedding dress. She plays with my children. He was silent for a moment before he summarised his speech. So, Mike, if you need legal advice, you are welcome to contact my firm. However, an attorney-client relationship is the only thing I can offer you. I don't have a father, just a mother. Mike thought he heard the thud of the judge's gavel again. The verdict was in. The judge was harsh, but fair, like life. <laughs>